um, it's a bit of a general topic, um, and I, I may drift off the topic a little bit. So do um, put questions in the chat. I won't be able to see the chat while I'm talking, but I know that um, SR UK um, are very kindly collecting all the bits and pieces together, and we'll, at the end we'll have a, a little discussion about it. So just to get straight into it, this is the sort of broad um, issues I'm going to talk about today um, scleroderma, from a scleroderma perspective. So lupus, Sjogren's, thyroid disease, myositis, which is muscle inflammation, PBC, which is a, a liver um, a condition, and then some lung diseases as well, and generalised um, discussion about overlaps with other connective tissue diseases. So um, the first thing that's worth pointing out is that autoimmunity is generally common in women. And, and that explains to a degree why these, these conditions cluster in women. There's a quite a significant female preponderance for some conditions. Raynaud's is at least twice as common in women as men. Scleroderma three times as common. But lupus and Sjogren's are both nine times commoner in women than men and thyroid disease 10 times commoner. So it's not surprising that these are female predominant diseases and many of you will have more than one. And in fact, 25% of patients with an autoimmune disease will have more than one. Some of you will have two, three, or even more. Um, and it's likely the background is that you have a genetic vulnerability to autoimmunity, and then you come across some, some trigger, probably an environmental trigger, who knows, that sets it off. And that's probably, the trigger probably has to happen at the right point in your hormonal cycle and so forth. And we, we often refer to this as a multi-hit hypothesis. So it takes more than one thing to trigger your immune system and more, one, more than one thing to, to cause a problem. Um, and interestingly, some of you may have observed recent little flares or triggers set off by the COVID vaccine or by COVID itself. And that doesn't surprise doctors like myself because we know that the COVID vaccine and COVID both stimulate your immune system. And if you stimulate the immune system in somebody with an autoimmune disease or autoimmune vulnerability, then they're more likely to get a flare, usually fortuitously very short lived. But there are some common diseases that cluster together, and there are at least three groups of common diseases that, that link together. And scleroderma probably falls into that middle group um, outlined on the slide there, uh, and is quite commonly linked with things like Sjogren's, rheumatoid, primary biliary cirrhosis, which is an autoimmune liver disease, um, and autoimmune thyroid disease. But in fairness, I have seen patients over the years who, who dip into other boxes and have other overlaps as well. So no overlap is ruled out, but some are commoner than others. Um, and when we're looking at patients with autoimmune disease, we measure antibodies in the blood. And antibodies are produced by your immune system. They're produced by the B cells in your immune system. And they're little proteins that circulate. Lots of us have got them. Um, and a, a very non-specific test, the ANA, um, is, is found in quite a lot of, an anti-nuclear antibody, is found in quite a lot of people. And I've got some figures here just to show you how common and positive ANA actually is. So up to 20%, one in five healthy 20-year-old females will have a positive. ANA. As many as 40% of 50-year-old females will have a positive ANA. In scleroderma, we expect at least half of you to have a positive ANA. Lupus patients have very high levels, 99%, and, and most other connective tissue diseases hover around the 50% level. So a positive ANA on its own doesn't make a diagnosis and doesn't tell you what the patient's got, but it may raise suspicions that there's an underlying autoimmune condition going on that you need to do a little bit more looking into. When they do an ANA, um, they often look at how high the level is, and they do what we call a teeter, and that means that they dilute the test down to find out how, how much, how high, how strong your ANA is. And if your um, teeter is more than 1 in 80, that's more likely to be significant than lower teeters. It tends not to fluctuate with disease activity. Activity, you've either got it or you haven't got it. And as I say, it's usually just a non-specific marker that lets doctors like me go ahead and look at other things. So investigate people for other things. There are some more specific antibody or protein markers that go with autoimmunity called ENAs or extractable nuclear antigens. There's a whole range of these and also some very specific scleroderma specific ones I'm going to talk about. But again, if you look at them, some of them link very clearly to a specific disease. So one of the most um, strong associations is between one called double-stranded DNA and lupus. And it's quite specifically associated with renal disease, kidney disease in lupus. But there are lots of other ones. And um, the one that I see a lot of, because I do a lot of Sjogren's work, is the Rho antibody. Um, and that's associated with Sjogren's and also with a condition that we call cutaneous lupus, where people have a very um, strongly photosensitive um, skin rash that has very characteristic um, features to it. 
Scleroderma has a whole range of antibodies. Um, and this, this list of antibodies, I'm afraid, is growing all the time. And when I qualified, we probably knew, knew mostly about the first two, but now we know about far more. Um, and I learned only a few days ago that anti-centromere antibody, which is one of the commonest antibodies that we see in scleroderma, actually occurs in two forms. So there's even two subgroups of anti-centromere antibodies these days. Um, and again, the antibodies can help you by giving you an idea of what to look for clinically. So they, can, they, they tend to associate with particular patterns of disease. So anti-centromere antibodies, for instance, are specifically associated with limited, limited disease, limited scleroderma. Now, that's not to say they're unique to that. In fact, I've got a couple of Sjogren's patients who carry the anti-centromere antibody um, and equally um, we see people with diffuse scleroderma that carry it but that's the the strongest association uh, and many of you may have in the past been diagnosed as what um, doctors used to call crest and crest is a descriptive term which describes patients who have a feet a classical um, accumulation of features including calcinosis for the c raynos for the r esophageal dysmotility i'm afraid it's the american spelling without the o for the e sclerodactyly which is the sticking down the sort of tethering of the skin that you see in the fingers and telangiectasia, which are the little blood spots you see under the, clins, under the skin. And it's also associated with something called pulmonary artery hypertension, which I'll mention later, which is a condition that affects the heart and the, heart and the lungs. Worth noting that this antibody may appear in your bloodstream many years before you develop the skin changes. So it is a marker of, but it doesn't mean you actually have clinical disease at that point in time. But certainly if we see patients who are strongly positive for this antibody, we would keep them under review um, and look out for problems in the future. The next one you may have heard of is the anti-SCL70, which tends to be associated with what we call diffuse disease and can be associated with ILD, which stands for inflammatory lung disease. Um, and there are a whole range of others that we can see in patients with scleroderma and patients with overlap conditions. This bottom group here are much more likely to be associated with the overlaps, anti-PMSCL, most often with myositis, um, muscle inflammation, um, and anti rho more often with Sjogren's, um, and new ones being added to this list all the time. And antibodies are important, but they're not the be all and end all of things. They help doctors decide which group you, you fall into. They may help guide the diagnosis and guide investigations, but they are not a diagnosis in their own right. So you do need clinical features to go along with these. And this is to show you yet more antibodies. Um, and this is a beautiful, from a medical point of view, this is a beautiful little picture, um, which shows you all the different antibodies and gives you an idea of what they're associated with. And you can see that there's a whole list of antibodies here that are in the connective tissue disease overlap group. So these are patients who tend to have overlaps. The row one we've already mentioned is the one I commonly see in Sjogren's and PMSCL is one commonly seen in scleroderma and in um, myositis, um, uh, muscle inflammation. So talking about some of those subgroups we've mentioned individually and talking about the things that you might expect to see in a patient who's got features. Um, so for um, patients who've got lupus overlap features, very often one of the most prominent features is the skin disease. And patients with lupus overlap very often get very character characteristic patterns of rashes. This is the most characteristic, although it's not actually particularly common. And we call it a butterfly rash because if you look at it head on, it looks a bit like a butterfly. In a true butterfly rash, it's supposed to include the bridge of the nose, whereas another common pseudo butterfly rash, rosacea, doesn't tend to include the bridge of the nose. Um, but if there's doubt about what's causing it, then some people will end up having a little biopsy. Um, but that is a very classical lupus feature, as are these two other ones, these two photographs here um, of um, what that the one on the bottom right we would call um, SCLE or subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus, SCLE. And this one here we'd call discoid lupus. And these can often scar and leave marks on the skin. And then other things that patients with overlap get and patients with lupus overlap in particular can get is joint disease. And um, this is a picture of some of a lady who has had um, lupus joint disease. And you'll see that her, her fingers are, are drifting over to the little finger side. We call this ulnar drift and that it's often called a Yakud's arthropathy. Um, and um, interestingly, if you examine this patient's hands, they're often not painful particularly, and you can often correct that deformity you can pull the, the fingers back into position although they drift back the moment you let go and as I say that's called a Yakud's arthropathy 
it's quite classically seen in patients with lupus. But you can see all manner of other things. This um, picture at the bottom here um, shows a, a pelvic x-ray, and that's a there's the hips, right and left. And just to orientate you, that's a normal right hip, and that's a very abnormal left hip. And if you look at the, the picture on the right, sorry, you've got to appreciate, we always look at, at um, x-rays back to front, so your right is, is their left, as it were. So this is the patient's right. You can see they've got a nice, round, smooth femoral head there, the hip, and can you see how flat and deformed it is on the other side? And this is a condition called avascular necrosis, um, which is sometimes seen um, in patients who've taken high dose steroids, but also seen spontaneously in people with lupus and other connective tissue diseases. Um, almost always, the patient with this condition will end up needing a uh, hip replacement. Um, it does; it tends not to improve spontaneously. This picture on the bottom right here um, is a picture of someone with Raynaud's phenomenon. Raynaud's is incredibly common, both in the normal population and in people with connective tissue diseases. And it, uh, most of you with scleroderma will have a very good understanding of what Raynaud's involves. Oh, there's another picture that's just popped up. So that's an X-ray of this individual here with the drifting hands. And what that shows you what that shows a rheumatologist is that although the, the fingers are deformed and drifting, the joints themselves are not damaged. The individual joints look fine. And that's very distinct from rheumatoid arthritis where you get joint damage. Other things that you can get um, in connective tissue diseases, including lupus, are inflammation of the heart and inflammation of the lungs. So the top two pictures are actually of the same patient. This is what we call a plain X-ray, a standard X-ray. And what you're looking at there is that the heart looks globular. It's enlarged. When you look at the scan, the same patient, this is a cross section through that this individual's chest through the heart. You can see the heart there and surrounding the heart, big red arrow to give you a clue there's something wrong um, there's a rim of fluid and that's called pericardial fluid we'll all have a tiny rim but this is a significant rim and this person's got pericarditis they've got inflammation of that lining layer around the heart which is causing fluid around the heart and giving the appearance of an enlarged heart on x-ray and this one here, the bottom set, again, the same patient in both of those two pictures in the bottom, you can see there's the heart there looking pretty normal sized, but you can see that this lung on the left, on the patient's left, looks smaller than the rung, lung on the patient's right. And that's because they've got fluid in that lung. So again, you see white on the plain x-ray and you can see the grainy fluid at the bottom of the lung on the patient's left. And that's um, what we call pleurisy or serocytis. It's inflammation of the lung lining the lung and it's produced fluid and as you might imagine these patients often present with chest pain and breathlessness um, and when you investigate them you found this and um, fortu fortuitously it tends to respond to treatment you need to treat the underlying condition um, to get these patients better. Now I'm mentioning antiphospholipid antibody syndrome although interestingly and for reasons I don't completely understand it's not particularly common in patients with, with scleroderma um, so this is a sticky bud phenomenon um, and it's where patients get clots. They can get clots in their calves and their calf veins. They can get clots in their arterial system and that can cause strokes and so forth. And it's also quite notorious for causing um, recurrent miscarriages because you get clots in the placenta and patients very sadly lose their babies um, early on in the pregnancy. But there are three tests for this. And patients are sometimes described as single, double or triple positive. The more tests are positive, the more serious the condition is. It is treatable with blood thinners. Um, but once you're on treatment, you're usually on treatment for light, life. And although it's very common in association with lupus, interestingly, it's not very common in association with scleroderma. Um, there are some case reports in the literature, but not many. Now, um, you heard at the beginning, I've got a special interest in Sjögren's, so I've obviously got a little bit of a bias towards that. And I think Sjögren's does overlap with scleroderma um, quite frequently, in fact. Um, and Sjögren's is classically described as occurring um, in a primary or a secondary form. We're moving a little bit away from that. We're understanding that actually the, the, the differentiating differentiation into those groups is not quite as clear cut as we'd like. Patients don't follow the rules as often as we'd like, and they often drift between these groups. But primary is usually where the condition occurs alone, and secondary or, or overlap, we're, we're increasingly causing, call, calling it, is where it occurs in association with another connective tissue disease. And I certainly do have some patients with scleroderma 
and with um, Sjogren's syndrome. We talked at the beginning about the antibodies. The classical antibody in Sjogren's is Rho. Not everyone has it. Maybe about 60, 70 percent are positive for Rho. The remainder are not. Um, and Sjogren's causes predominantly dryness. It dries up your glands. Um, and most people present with dry eyes and dry mouth because that's the most visible ones. But you can get a whole array of symptoms, dry cough, dry throat, dry vagina, dry gut, etc. So the symptoms can be very nonspecific. Um, in the early stages, patients often don't complain of dryness of the eyes so much as grittiness. And you've got to bear in mind that as a, a system, our bodies are beautifully put together and they are designed to have lots of reserve. So, for instance, when it comes to saliva, your normal person will produce over a litre of saliva a day. You actually have to lose 70% um, of that before you're physically aware of it. So, um, in the early stages, patients don't necessarily complain particularly of the dryness, although it is a feature in later disease, and patients can get aches and pains and fatigue. Um, dry eyes, um, it's worth just understanding a little bit about dry eyes, because um, once you understand why your eyes is dry it helps you treat them so lots of you I know will have dry eye disease um, even if you haven't got full-blown Sjogren's you'll have dry eyes in association with your scleroderma and what you need to understand is that the eye is the surface of the eye is very complex the first thing to point out is that the the absolute surface of the eye, the conjunctiva, is not flat. You'll see in this little cartoon here, there are some little projections, what we call villi, little fingers. Now, the reason for that is that having those projections increases the, um, the surface area of the eye and gives more room, if you like, for the tears to cling on to. Now, if you put eye drops into your eye that contain preservatives on a regular basis, you will blunt those villi and reduce the total surface of that area of your eye. And even though you're putting eye drops in, you'll make your dry eye worse. So if you've got dry eyes and you're using eye drops every day, you need to use preservative free eye drops. That's rule number one. Rule number two is you need to put in them in regularly. Lots of people put their eye drops in, in the morning and think that's enough. And that isn't enough if you've got a dry eye you need to put your eye drops in a minimum of four times a day. And the reason for that is that tears evaporate all the time. So even though you can get some really good quality watery eye drops, um, they will not last more than two or three hours in your eye and you need to replace them. So you need to get into the habit of putting them in regularly. And just to remind you, one other little thing is that as um, dry eye disease progresses, the surface of the eye, the surface of the cornea becomes less sensitive, not more sensitive. So actually, you're less aware of the dryness and less likely to put your eyes drops in regularly. The other thing to point out is that on top of the watery layer, there is a, um, a oily layer. Um, and that is important for three reasons. The oily layer slows down evaporation of tears. It improves um, lubrication. So it improves the feeling when you blink. It's, it, it acts as the lubricating layer when you blink. And probably most important of all, it does something called stabilizing the tear film. So when you blink or I blink, well, in fact, well, I'll start with me. When I blink, my tear film should last a good 10 seconds. And then what happens is that tear film breaks up and you have to blink again to refresh it. And tear film is important because your eye automatically focuses through the tear film. Now, um, if you've got dry eye, that tear film will break up in two or three seconds and your vision will blur and you have to blink and refocus. And that's quite tiring and it gives you fatigued eyes. So one thing that you can do that helps fatigued eyes is improve the oily content of the tear because that stabilizes the tear film and stops it breaking up so rapidly. Now, the oily film is produced by the meibomian glands, which are little oil producing glands that sit in your eyelids. So what you need to do is stimulate those, my, stimulate those meibomian glands and you can do that very very, very simply using a warm eye compress um, and you can't just get away with the flannel you do need to use a proper eye compress because flannels um, if you put them in hot water are, are warm for seconds only and cool down too quickly you need to have a warm compress that lasts a minimum of seven minutes and ideally ten and you can buy them through um, your local chemist or online and 
they they come in like little eye masks and they're usually um got beads or gel inside you pop them in a microwave and pop them in your eyes um for you know, pop them in a microwave for you know 20 30 seconds and on your eyes for 10 minutes and if you do that every day you will improve this oily layer and improve your tear film and improve your vision so it's really important and then i just wanted to talk a little bit about the mouth because dry mouth um accelerates dental decay and I know a lot of you will have dry mouth again even the ones who haven't got Sjogren's and your mouth a dry mouth lacks saliva saliva is really important for tooth health because saliva washes your teeth removes any excess gubbins and so forth but also maybe even more importantly that it neutralizes acids most things that we eat particularly nice things like sweets and fruits and so forth are acidic and saliva neutralizes that and prevents damage to the enamel the shiny surface of our teeth if you're not producing good quantities of saliva you won't get the neutralization and you'll get accelerated dental decay so it's really important you're really proactive with dental care you clean your teeth very carefully you avoid sugary sweet foods you see your dentist regularly you use these little interdental brushes to get all the gubbins out from between your teeth um, and you use a high fluoride toothpaste a good quality toothpaste a couple of other little things you can do you can use xylomelts are really useful they're little slow release xylitol pastels you can buy them over the counter uh, and xylitol is good for your teeth because it does two things first of all it encourages moisture that's lovely but secondly the xylitol itself inhibits um, a bug called Streptococcus mutans, which um, can accelerate dental decay. So using xylitol regularly slows down dental decay. Um, and uh, that you can, some, in fact, as a patient pointed this out to me, Peppersmiths do a xylitol mint, which is a sugar-free xylitol mint, and they're really good as well. Oops some more photographs of teeth oh and i was going to talk about vaginal dryness no one ever um talks about that so i thought i'd mention it here that vaginal dryness is common in patients with sugars and it's common in connective tissue diseases altogether there's two probable reasons for that as women go through the menopause so as we get older and our estrogen levels fall the genital and vaginal skin thins that's a natural phenomenon if you've got dryness on top of that, because you've got a connective tissue disease or you're on drugs that make you dry, that thin skin can tear and crack. And that's really unpleasant and uncomfortable. So there are two things that, make it, that can help. First of all, I commonly recommend that people, people consider using a topical estrogen. Um, you can get creams or pessaries. This one's a little picture of a pessary, Vagifem. It's a very common make prescribed by GPs. And what that does is it improves the quality of the genital skin. It plumps it up. It makes it a little bit more resilient, a bit more elastic. But you usually need to use a moisturizer on top. Uh, and there's lots of these. On, you can get these over the counter or some GPs are able to prescribe some of them. So the estrogens have to come on prescription. But um, things like Replens and YesVM, you can buy over the counter you may be able to get some uh, versions of these from your GP as well. And then just to mention, um, these are drugs which I use sometimes in my patients, but which need prescriptions. Pilocarpine and carbocystin can be useful. Pilocarpine stimulates secretions in a very non-specific way. So it just gives your glands a bit of a kick and that can be helpful in some patients and carbocystine thins thins the sticky secretions and that can be helpful in people producing sticky phlegm and so forth who have got a sticky dry cough. So that's all I'm going to say about Sjogren's. I'm very happy to take questions later. Um, I was going to mention um, a few other things that we see in overlap. So myositis is muscle inflammation. The classical group that get this are what we call the PMSCL. So it, it's almost in the name of the antibody, isn't it? Polymyositis, scleroderma overlap. Um, and these patients often present with raised muscle enzymes, muscle pain and weakness. This is a, um, a picture. The top one here, the pink one, is a photograph. Um, of a slice of muscle from a patient with a condition. Now, in a normal person, you see the muscle fibers, but you see hardly any cells around them. You see very few cells in a normal muscle section. In this person who's got polymyositis, who's got inflammation, you see lots of inflammatory cells all around the muscle fibers. The other thing that you can see here, if you look very carefully, is that um, the muscle fibers are different sizes. So again, in a healthy person, the muscle fibers are all the same size. In this person, you can see that some of the muscle fibers are shrunk and uh, as if they're being damaged by the inflammation. And this scan below, um, the black and white scan here, um, is an MRI scan, a very fancy scan through the thighs of a patient with myositis. And what this is showing you is that they're lying on their back. So on the top, you can see a section through what we call your quadriceps muscle 
muscles, and those are the muscles at the front of the thigh. On the bottom, we can see a section through your hamstring muscles, which are the muscles at the back of the thigh. And normal muscles should look a bit like the ones on the bottom, dark gray. And this white in the front is all the inflammation being caused by the myositis. And interestingly, quite commonly in myositis, you get much more inflammation in the front of thigh muscles than you do in the back. And that's shown beautifully on this picture here. So um, I also mentioned thyroid disease. Thyroid disease is phenomenally common. Um, one, uh, 11 percent of women over the age of 60 will have thyroid disease. So that is incredibly common. One in 10. That's just amazing. But the prevalence in scleroderma is probably twice that. So it is a common association. And interestingly, that association is seen with other rheumatic diseases as well, like Sjogren's and, and lupus. So you are probably twice as likely to get thyroid disease as a lady or without um, scleroderma. Um, and there are, there's an increased prevalence of both autoimmune thyroiditis, that's inflammation of the thyroid gland, and underactive thyroid hypothyroidism um, and I probably would recommend every couple of years you have your thyroid function checked if you haven't had that done already just to make sure you're not, drip, you're not drifting into an underactive thyroid state and um, thyroid disease underactive thyroid just makes you feel a bit run down and tired so it's quite a difficult thing to pick up sometimes in that you know it's often put down to other factors and if you've got a chronic disease it could easily be missed. So talk a little bit about primary biliary cholangitis. That's a liver disease, an inflammatory liver disease. It is associated definitely with um, Sjogren's, scleroderma, and other connective tissue diseases. Um, it's, it's got a very specific antibody, the anti-mitochondrial antibody. And a bit like scleroderma and all of these conditions, it's got a female predominance. So eight women for every man, one man with this. So it's very female predominant. It classically starts in your mid 50s um, and it causes chronic cholestatic, chronic inflammation within the, the liver itself. There is a very good treatment. So it's worth diagnosing this condition because ursodeoxycholic acid can be very helpful. There is an association with limited scleroderma, interestingly. Um, and when you look for it, up to about a quarter of scleroderma patients will carry the antimitochondrial antibody, but only about one in 10 of them will actually develop primary biliary cholangitis. So, so the condition, the liver condition itself is, is, is found in about two and a half percent of patients with scleroderma, but the antibody in 25 percent. So having the antibody doesn't mean you've got the condition, but it may mean you're vulnerable to the condition in later life. So you just need to have an eye kept on your liver function tests. Um, and then I think I'm coming towards the end, lung disease. So um, different types of lung disease that you can get in scleroderma. You can get inflammation in the lung, um, interstitial lung disease. Um, up to 30% of you will develop some of this, some, some signs of this. And it's commoner in those with diffuse disease. You can get fibrosis in the lungs, pulmonary fibrosis, and you can get a complication called pulmonary artery hypertension. And that's where stiffness in the lungs has caused back pressure on the heart and can cause heart problems. And it often presents with breathlessness, um, as do many of these other conditions. All of these are conditions that we are getting better at diagnosing and better at treating. And there are nowadays treatments that can help patients with these complications of long term, usually scleroderma. So I think it's worth saying that overlaps with other connective tissue diseases and coexistent autoimmune diseases are very common. So I said at the beginning, 25% of you will have more than one connective tissue disease. These diseases cluster together. The classical cluster with scleroderma is going to be Sjogren's PBC thyroid disease, but it could be anything. Um, and I think because the thyroid disease is the most common of all of these, 20%, one in five, I think it's worthwhile having a screening test for it every couple of years just to make sure you're not dipping into an underactive thyroid state. So um, I just wanted to do my acknowledgements. Thank you very much. And I'm very happy to take questions. I'll stop sharing my slides so you can see us properly better. Great. Thank you very much for the talk. That was so interesting. Thank you. We've had quite a few questions through and I've got I've got some more written down that people have sent in previously. Yes. OK. Um, so first one, what is your experience with LDN low dose? naltrexone with regards to pain control in scleroderma um, oh, now 
Uh, okay, so LDN, low dose naltrexone, is something um, that's sort of outside the mainstream, I think it's fair to say. It's not routinely available in the UK. And I do know that some patients get it on private prescriptions, but it's not something that's recognized and prescribed on, uh, on the NHS as such. Um, I think it's a bit of a controversial subject. So um, there have been publications looking at it in things like fibromyalgia, chronic pain syndromes, and so forth. And some of them look positive and some of them look negative. Um, I actually did a little review of all the literature a couple of years ago for the BSSA because they had lots of questions coming through on it. And in the end, I had to be honest and say there's no evidence that this is any good, but there are anecdotal reports of some patients benefiting. Um, it is probably safe. Um, it isn't available, as I say, on the NHS. You have to pay for it privately. It's not huge hugely expensive but you know obviously it's it is inevitably it costs more than you would like um i think i'd have to be honest and say that there isn't enough evidence to support it at the moment there are lots of studies going on so it may be things will change in the future but there isn't enough evidence to really recommend it at the moment okay. uh, our next question says i've recently been diagnosed with autoimmune hepatitis i have primary shogans with overlap diffuse scleroderma 12 year history i can find very little information about this is it rare it is rare you are unlucky the commonest overlap is with pbc even when sjogren's the commonest overlap is with pbc but autoimmune hepatitis is seen um Interestingly, when you look at the biopsies of people with autoimmune hepatitis, um, the pictures look very similar to the pictures that we see in lip biopsies with these inflammatory cells. So um, there is clearly a link between the two conditions. Um, and most people will need a little bit of specialist help from the gastroenterologist, the liver specialist, as well as from the uh, rheumatologist. I've got a couple of patients who have both. There's no doubt about that. Um, the liver specialists are very good at treating this. Um, Ursula deoxycholic acid works sometimes, even in autoimmune, but, uh, but, and sometimes they give them steroids and azathioprine and so forth. But yes, it is seen. You are unlucky. It is rare. Um, Elaine said, uh, I've noticed flares triggered by my period hormone changes and have a friend with scleroderma with the same experience, but we can find no research on this link. Is it recommended by the medical community? So there is evidence that oestrogen levels affect autoimmune connective tissue diseases uh, and that doesn't surprise me because if these are female predominant diseases they classically present after puberty um, they sometimes get better sometimes not always get better after the menopause I have definitely seen cases triggered by HRT and triggered by the combined oral contraceptive pill. So I think hormonal changes are definitely a factor. Uh, there is a little bit of research in the literature, but it's not very definitive. The trouble is with periods, it's really difficult to measure because you know people's hormones change so rapidly. So that so there isn't much in the literature. You're right, but I think I think it's a very genuine, real phenomenon. Yes. So I would agree with you. If you say it happens, I would believe you because that's what we see. It's always interesting. Isn't do you it? recommend yeah. HRT? Yes. Okay. Do you want me to carry on reading? I can see them now. Do you recommend HRT? Is the next one, isn't it? Is that it right? Is. Yeah, I know you've um, talked. That's about the one you're on. Our, you know. Yeah. So, so HRT. So this is a slightly tricky subject. So HRT. Has, goes through phases of being good for you, bad for you, good for you, bad for you, doesn't it? Um, and being fashionable, unfashionable, and so forth. I think I am nervous about systemic conventional HRT because I have seen patients' disease flare when they go on HRT. But there is no evidence that having topical estrogens, having, you know, estrogens on your skin down below, ever cause flares so these are two different phenomena so so what you're doing with the with the vagifems and the estrogen creams is you're just giving an estrogen dose to a few layers of cells um, in your genital area and your vagina you're not giving the whole body um, a dose and I went to a really lovely talk given by a gynecologist about HRT and what she said and I believed her <laughs> was that if you were to use a, a vaginal cream one of the recommended vaginal creams regularly for a year that would only be equivalent in terms of estrogen dose to taking one dose of ordinary HRT so I think that we're shifting away from you know oral HRT mm -hmm. to the more topical agents and I think there's evidence they are safer but it's always a balance some people have intolerable menopausal symptoms you know and, and if you do you have to weigh up your own risks whether that's something you live with or not so it's a quality of life issue at that point it's polymyalgia is that the next one we're on it is, it's yeah. polymyalgia autoimmune yeah and how do you tell the difference from fibromyalgia so 
polymyalgia is really poorly understood. So polymyalgia rheumatica is a disease that we see in the over 60s predominantly, um, and it gets commoner as you get older. Um, it's, it is still slightly commoner in women, women than men, but it isn't quite as dramatic as, as, as the other autoimmune diseases. It's possibly autoimmune. I don't think we honestly know. It normally prevent, presents very classically with um, uh, what we call proximal, so pain and stiffness in your shoulders and your hips, in your pelvic girdle and your shoulder girdle. It is associated with raised inflammatory markers. GPs are very good at picking it up. They see much more of it than I do, actually, because they look after the patients and it responds to treatment with steroids. Um, it is very distinct from fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia um, is a condition for which there is no diagnostic test. So with PMR, you've got a blood test that can usually tell you what's going on. With fibromyalgia, there is no diagnostic test. It's effectively a diagnosis of exclusion. You need to make sure patients haven't got anything else. But a classical fibromyalgia patient will have widespread pain, which is chronic. Um, they'll have a poor sleep pattern with often unrefreshing sleep. And they will have tenderness, tenderness across their body. And they'll have aches and pains everywhere. Now, fibromyalgia is poorly understood. And there are lots of different underlying mechanisms that can end up in fibromyalgia um, from you know emotional distress to traumatic events to post-operatively we've seen it post ITU um, there are even some features of long COVID that look like fibromyalgia so so it is a difficult condition you can certainly have fibromyalgia and something else but it isn't an overlap autoimmune disease. It's a distinct problem. So, um, and some people can tell the difference. They can say, oh, it's my fibromyalgia playing up rather than it's my arthritis playing up and so forth. So I think fibromyalgia is not considered to be an overlap with scleroderma. It's a distinct entity. It's a poorly understood condition. Interestingly, like most of the conditions we've been talking about today, it is commoner in women. It's often younger women, I think, than some of the older women. Mm -hmm. um, and there's often an underlying something driving it um you know either a, a physical stress or a mental stress or or something going on that's that's or triggered it so interestingly you can artificially induce a fibromyalgia like syndrome by sleep depriving people so sleep deprivation deprivation seems very important okay so we onto the i've just turned 40 yeah lucky you mm -hmm. just turned 40 um under rheumatology antibodies came back negative okay so dry eyes and dry mouth with ne negative antibodies is quite common um so only 60 to 70 percent of patients with Sjogren's will be antibody positive it's the same in scleroderma not all of those with scleroderma will carry the antibodies many won't and quite often the diagnosis is made on clinical grounds the antibodies definitely help they help us <clears throat> make the diagnosis and they help us give you an idea of what's going to happen in the future. They, they can help us prognostically, <clears throat> but they can't always give us the answer. Um, in Sjogren's, I often do lip biopsies to make the diagnosis. <clears throat> in terms of an underactive thyroid, you ask about hypothyroidism. You certainly could have hypothyroidism. It's a quite an easy diagnosis to make on blood testing. So um, there's a really, really effective blood test called the TSH. And TSH stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. And the very first thing that happens when your thyroid becomes underactive is that TSH level goes up, trying to drive your thyroid to produce more thyroxine. So it's very, very sensitive. It's quite a simple test. Um, I would probably do it every couple of years in my patients with other connective tissue diseases because it's so easy to miss. Um, and if you've got symptoms that are suggestive, you might want to ask your GP. You may find they've done it, but it might be worth asking. So is there a reason the NHS doesn't do autoimmune checks such as standard for early intervention reasons? Oh, so one of the problems, I can tell you what we're struggling with at the moment, is we have seen a lot of positive antibodies post-COVID, post-COVID infection and post-COVID vaccine. And there is some evidence that, the, that, that you can get transient antibodies after something that triggers your immune system. So I think if we were to screen everyone with these tests, we'd find people who didn't have the test but had the antibodies. And then what do you do with them? And that's really difficult. So the, the conventional way of doing this is to is first to start off by looking at the patient. I know that's a bit novel these days. Not everyone looks at patients these days. Though. But, you know, ideally get someone to physically look at you or examine you or listen to your story. And then based on that, then 
to do that because you can sometimes end up doing the wrong test if you don't listen to what the patient's saying so you know if someone came to me and said oh I'm tired all the time you know I, 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 that that would lead me down a certain route mm-hmm. um but also you need to explore the factors underneath it and you know and there are but even your GP should know a little bit more about you than just your tests you know they'll know about your family circumstances they'll know about your past medical history they might if you're lucky even know your family history did your mum have thyroid disease one very strong indicator is that, that you're going to get it is if your mum had it often runs in families mm. so that that may be why things are delayed but uh, some of these conditions are notoriously difficult to diagnose and they can take ages uh, you know the trouble is with medicine it's not black and white it's shades of grey so somebody with a menopause, I think it's been crunching, cracking things. Okay, so unfortunately, so so lots of people complain of more joint pain post-menopause. So when I first started practicing as rheumatologist many years ago, I quite often used to say to people, oh, go on HRT, you'll feel much better. Now, I don't do that anymore because I think actually um, the evidence is all it does is slow it down or put it off a bit. You have to go through it eventually. And also there are other more nuanced things about HRT nowadays with risks and so forth. So so I think we all do age a bit as we get older and sadly going to the menopause can accelerate that aging for a couple of years, but often it does settle down. And although it sounds, I mean, you may think I'm going on about this, but actually keeping moving, keeping active is the best thing you can do for your joints, whatever age you are. So keep active, keep moving. Don't let that spine get you down. Um, so crest and APS, well, you're unusual. So, this, so we've got a, a post here from a lady who's uh, who's got both Crest syndrome, that's the limited scleroderma, calcinosis reinos, esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly, and telangiectasia, and antiphospodantipodis syndrome. So you're unusual. Um, and um, in the literature, there aren't many of you. Um, and you're on hydroxychloroquine and aspirin. And that's probably good treatment. So hydroxychloroquine, aspirin is definitely a blood thinner. Even hydroxychloroquine has a bit of an antiplatelet effect. Now, if you have a def, so if you've never had a clot, that's completely adequate. If you do go on and get a clot, then they might up the blood thinning treatment. And there's lots of options nowadays. It used to only be warfarin, but there are other options as well. But I would say if you haven't had a major clot, what you're on is right. It's about right. Oh, gosh, this is a complicated one. <laughs> My husband has chronic graft versus host disease post stem cell transplant. Oh, one result of this is scleroderma. It's also a trismus. This is to do with the jaw. He does not see a rheumatologist, but is followed up by the transplant team. Is trismus seen at all in scleroderma? Oh, that's a really complicated one. Um, I think I'd have to be honest and say I don't really know the answer to that one. I certainly haven't seen it much myself. I do see a couple of things I do see. I see TMJ inflammation. So your temporomandibular joint is the joint that you can feel. If you open and shut your mouth and put your finger just in front of your ear, you can feel it there. And that's your temporomandibular joint. You can get arthritis of that joint. So that might affect your, because trismus is where your your jaw goes into spasm. Um, Stress, I mean, you know, uh, that that, that can make it worse. Um, I don't know about abnormalities in, electrolyte levels because you've obviously had quite a lot wrong with you but but having abnormal minerals and salts in your blood can contribute to this um i think is it worth him seeing it might be quite often what happens in this situation which might be worth it is it might be worth the transplant team talking to a rheumatologist and seeing if there's anything they can do um because otherwise i i think you may have a trip and they might go oh do you think we can help but it may be they can have they can they can have a chat with the rheumatologist and see if there's anything they can do in your husband's specific case Oh, can a dilated aorta be caused by systemic scleroderma? Oral lichen. So oral lichen, I'll start at the end. Oral lichen planus is commonly seen in Sherbrooke's because it's a, it's a dry, it's an inflamed chronic irritation thing, isn't it? And you can get it in the mouth and you can get it um, down below. So that could be linked to Sherbrooke's, yes. Dilated aorta, um, you can get back pressure on the heart from pulmonary artery hypertension. But I think... That would be a dilated aorta would be very rare. If it is linked, it'd be very rare. You might want to, and, and your rheumatologist might be able to advise on other possible causes like hypertension, heart disease, ischemic heart disease, all those things. My GP thinks I've got scleroderma and possible Sjogren's and swallowing problems. Right, so swallowing problems are very common in both conditions. Scleroderma classically causes um, esophageal dysmotility, so problems with the swallowing mechanism in the gullet. Um, we also see that in Sherbrooke's from time to time, and we also see dryness in both conditions, which can also contribute to swallowing difficulties. Um, I think 
most of what you can do is just practical. Chew your food really well. Sit up properly when you eat um, to give yourself a chance to get things down. Always have a glass of water to help get things down. You may have to fiddle with textures. Bread is particularly difficult. If you've got a, a, a poorly functioning esophagus, it tends to ball up and get stuck. So you might have to avoid bread, have more rice maybe. That's that kind of texture. Um, some people do use um, drugs that lower acid levels. So there are things that your GP can give you, like a meprazole, um, ranitidine, those sort of drugs. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of sort of like herbally things. So um, I quite often recommend marshmallow root extract. That's quite good for soothing the, the, gut, the gullet. So that might be worth a go while you wait for an appointment. Yes. Do you see more monoclonal gammopathies with autoimmune diseases? Yes, I think you do. MGUS is quite common. Um, and that's not surprising because MGUS is overactivity of the B cells and B cells are part of the immune system and the immune system is overactive. So, yes, I think the answer to that is yes, we do. And I've got quite a lot of patients with MGUS in, in association with their, their Sjogren's in particular, but other connected tissue disease in general. Oh, real question was heart palpitations. So hypo, hypothyroidism. Hyperthyroidism, an overactive thyroid can cause your heart to race. An underactive thyroid? No, I don't think so. So I'm not sure that I can connect those two, to be honest with you. One of the drugs I use for Sjogren's pilocarpin can sometimes get palpitations. Um, so whether it's linked to that, I can't necessarily explain that. So somebody with limited scleroderma and muscle pain intensifies when I go to sleep. Hmm. Hmm. I'm not sure about that. Um, to be honest with you, maybe, I mean, I'm sure you do all the right things like gentle exercise and so forth. Um, it, muscle pain can cover a, a multitude of sins. It may be that you need to be checked to see you haven't got overlap myositis. That's incredibly unusual, though. But um, maybe have a chat with your rheumatologist, your GP, about testing your muscle enzymes or your thyroid. That's the other thing that can give you muscle pain. OK, so my thyroid test comes back OK. That's fine. That's good. It's a very sensitive test. It will pick it up. What you probably need to do is have it done every couple of years. I wouldn't. There's no more detailed tests. The TSH is the best test. That is the best test. Um, somebody with PBC and Raynaud's, whether she had undiagnosed scleroderma. Um, she might have had, um, possibly. Um, we weren't very good at diagnosing it decades ago, probably when your mum had it. Um, are you more likely? Well, the trouble is, is that all of these things run in families a bit. Um, difficult to answer that. <laughs> um, I think probably you need to be alert for any potential questions and any potential um, problems and report early to your GP if you're worried and tell your GP you've got this family history because GPs know, like people like me know, that things run in families. Okay, okay. have I done? Brilliant. We have a couple of minutes left, and actually, yeah. we've got a couple of questions that came yeah. up pre webinar. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, one of them is I see a rheumatologist, dermatologist, gastro, and lung specialist, and they also do. Oh, wow. Things. I find the appointments mm. upsetting and confusing. Do you have any tips to help me come out with the right or useful information? Um, make a list. I think making lists helps. I quite like lists, actually. <laughs> Patients sometimes turn up and say, Right, I've got this is my list today. And I say, Okay, oh, I see your list. <laughs> And then, you know, so then you can just that, that helps guide what you're getting out of consultation. And also, I think maybe ask the doctors the questions they're likely to be able to answer. So, you know, if you're seeing a gastroenterologist, ask them about your gut, mm -hmm. focus on things, because actually you'll get more out of the consultation that way. You know, make a list of the gut things that are bothering you. What answers do you want? Do you want to know what medicine might help? Do you want to know what diet might help? You know, and, and, and direct the consultation. I think... Uh, I, you know, I think from the other side as well, being a medic and seeing patients, you know, we're sometimes struggling because patients sometimes can come in and bombard us with questions. You think, oh, my goodness, I, I don't know the answer to that, that and that. Maybe if I can just deal with this, this and this. So I think maybe make a list of all the problems you've got and then chunk them up into the things that you think are relevant. Mm -hmm. that, maybe that would be my tip. Take a friend helps someone else to listen. Why? Because because actually the other thing is, is that and you'll have noticed this today. I, uh, yeah. So I chat away. But you can't chat and think and talk and write at the same time. So mm -hmm. maybe if you you get someone to take some notes for you or to remind you or to keep you on track, that can help. You are allowed, I think, nowadays to take someone back in with you. There was a time when you had to go in on your own. It was a bit grim, wasn't it? Yeah. It's always nice to have someone in the room with you as well, isn't it? Yeah. I think so. I think it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, and our last one is, I have SSC, but a family member has just been diagnosed with vasculitis at a similar age to me. 
and our symptoms are really similar. Could I have this as well? So vasculitis is inflammation in the lining of the blood vessels. And the trouble with vasculitis is that it can present with anything. So vasculitis can cause um, ulcers on your fingers. It can cause inflammation in any part of your body. It's one of these really complex mimicking conditions that can look like anything. It's often misdiagnosed because it's so difficult and it's so complex. Um, I think there's not a big overlap between scleroderma and vasculitis at all, actually. Um, but I think you, you've got to have a bit of faith in your rheumatologist. So rheumatologists do look out for these things. And, and vasculitis, there are a different, completely different set of antibodies in, in vasculitis to the ones that we see in scleroderma. So if you've got a confident diagnosis of scleroderma, I would stick with that. But if you're worried, ask your, your specialist. Great. Well, I think that was all. Oh, no, we've had a, we've had a couple more questions. Um, oh, just just oh, some more. Oh, right. Okay. So there's two more coming. Is that right? Okay. Okay. I've just. I've, sorry. It takes me a while to get the hang of this. <laughs> oh, with the liver disease, we've done. We've done the liver disease. We have. The next one's very complex. Right. Okay. So your daughter has the SCL70 antibody, and a number of systemic sclerosis symptoms. She's just turned 19. Seems to be accumulating symptoms with time. She's recently started what we think might be GERD. That's gastroesophageal reflux disease. Not painful, sounds more like a hip hiccup. Yes, yes. So, so this is the problem with these antibodies. You can have the antibodies before you have the condition. And then you're in this awful position. You've got the antibody. Are you going to go on and develop the full-blown condition or not? And the trouble is, is that we all, we're all different. And you can't stop it developing. We haven't got any drugs at the moment that halt this disease, but there are things that you can do to make life more tolerable. And also, if you're monitored carefully, you know, things like your blood pressure's watched and so forth, and then that can improve outcomes. So I think it might be worth thinking about her being on something to reduce acid secretion, um, such as um, omeprazole, um, lansoprazole, there's a whole range of them, all endanols, or famotidine, ranitidine, cimetidine, or as I said, good old marshmallow root extract. Um, and I think if she's had the diagnosis, the antibody, she must be under somebody, I would imagine, or has been seen by somebody. So it might be worth at some, at some point in the future going back to see the specialist and, you know, getting them to recheck to make sure that she isn't developing progressive disease. Ooh. Ooh. Your mum had, some with mum had thyroid cancer. Yes, you are more at risk of, of thyroid dysfunction disease. Yes, definitely. 20%. You've got a one in five risk. So you do need to watch out for that. Okay. I think we have now. <laughs> so I, think, I think we've made it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right. Time yes. as well. Lovely. Thank you. Bye.